For thousands of years, these lands that are now Michigan were covered with forest, and the only inhabitants were the Indians. There were abundant wild fruits, fishing, wild game for food. The French were the first white men to see this beautiful part of the country over 300 years ago on August 24, 1679. The expedition was led by a French uh, explorer by the name of La Salle. He had a very long French name, but to shorten it, we'll call him Robert La Salle. In August of 1679, a small sailing vessel could be seen coming up St. Clair River. This was La Salle's famous boat, the Griffin. It was only 60 feet long, the first to sail into Lake Huron. The ship was constructed and launched on the Niagara River as a seven-cannon ship. It had a crew of 32. It sailed across Lake Erie, Lake Huron, and Lake Michigan through uncharted waters that only canoes had previously explored. On a side note, uh, Lake St. Clair was actually named by La Salle. It was named after Claire of Assisi. St. Clair of Assisi is an Italian saint and one of the first followers of St. Francis of Assisi. The early spelling of Lake St. Clair was spelt like the saint here, C-L-A-R-E, and later it was changed to C-L-A-I-R. This map gives you an idea of the route the Griffin took. Uh, it went from the Niagara River uh, down to the Detroit River and then, of course, up to Lake St. Clair and then on to Saginaw Bay and uh, up to Mackinac Island. The Griffin arrives at Washington or Rock Island. Knowing sailing would be dangerous in winter, LaSalle decided to stay behind and travel via canoe. He sent Griffin back carrying a load of furs heading for Niagara. Griffin left on September 18, 1679, never to be seen again. She would be the last European-style ship to sail the Upper Great Lakes for nearly 100 years. The first white men to come to an area that would be later Port Huron was a few French families that came from Canada. These French families built shanties along the St. Clair River and the Black River, and they lived peaceably with the Indians. Shortly after the first group of uh, French settlers came into this area, a second uh, group of settlers came into this area, which included a fellow by the name of Ansem Pettit. He married a lady from the first group of settlers, and they built a log cabin on the lowlands near St. Clair River, which is where Vantage Point is today. In time, the waters washed over it, and he built a frame house on higher ground about where Court and Third Streets meet. It is said to be the first frame house that was built in the future city of Port Chern by a non-native. His property consisted of 19 acres which he farmed. He also did some fur trading on the side. Later his son Edward Pettit planted this ground and called it Peru. This was the beginning of Port Huron. You can see that plaid in this map from 1857. As we zoom back out here, you can see the other plats that were to follow that would make up the city of Port Huron. In 1838, he was one of the signers of the petition to the circuit court requesting that the then existing plats be recognized as the village of Port Huron. As you can see in this commemorative coin, well, I said all that to say this. Before we get over on Lapeer again, there's one more house that we want to look at on Griswold Street. If you're going west, it's just before you get to 15th Street. You've probably been by it many times without realizing the historical significance of the home, or even that the home was as old as it is. In 1836, Edward Pettit purchased the land that you see this house sitting on, and this land would become to be known as the Pettit Farm. Today, it looks like a small house on a small lot, but at one time, it was a good-sized farm. Looking at the Google map here, you can see uh, that star represents the home on Griswold Street. And the boundaries of the farm were 
Griswold Street on the north and Pettis Street on the south. Hmm, I wonder where the name Pettis Street came from. And of course, 16th Street on the west and 13th Street on the east. So it was a pretty good chunk of land. This land was farmland long before the house was built. Edward Pettit appears to have sold the crops wholesale, and since he made trips to the Upper Peninsula to trade with the Indians there, he probably sold the crops there as well. Edward also built a brick business building, which is still standing at 914 Military Street. And today is occupied by Sentec. And as we look at the second floor, at one time, uh, this was an office that was occupied by Edward. The home wasn't built on this property until about 1860. And in 1862, Edward's father, Anselm, died in this home. Edward Pettit died about 1875. He left a will that called for using some of his estate funds for the purpose of building an orphanage, but for some reason this was never done. The estate was divided among his living children, who at that time was Louisa, Marshall, John, and Frank. Louisa and her husband continued to live at the house for some time after Edward's death, and then Marshall moved back in. The house was continuously occupied by four generations of the founding Pettit family. Most of the information I've shared with you on Edward Pettit was taken from this website here, Orchard Area History and Preservation Association. It's run by Vicki Priest, and she's done a wonderful job on many different historical items of Port Sharon. If you're interested in history or the preservation of historical buildings, you'll certainly enjoy this site. Vicki has done a wonderful job of research on the Pettit family. So if you'd like to know more of the story, and there's much more here than I told you, uh, click on this site, and I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, now we can get back to Lapeer Avenue and see where we left off. We left off uh, actually at this intersection here, which is Lapeer and 10th Street. But before we go any further west on Lapeer, there's a couple of things uh, I neglected to show you on uh, 10th Street um, going north near the bridge. So let's go over there. All right, going to the north end of 10th Street, uh, we can see the condos here along Black River. But uh, we can also see Water Street uh, intersecting with 10th Street. But at one time, Water Street went all the way through across 10th Street and uh, met up with Lapeer and Water Street further down to the east. The red line perimeter here shows where Foster Lumber and Builder Supplies was. This was a pretty big outfit and uh, pretty well took care of all of the builder's needs, the cinder block and lumber and everything else and it fronted uh, 10th Street, but it went down Water Street quite a ways too. I don't have any photographs of Foster's, but we do have this Sanborn map. That gives you a pretty good idea what the layout was like. You can see the river there toward the top, and as we go down, we can see the whole complex. They also had another location at the foot of Water Street, uh, right about where the farmer's market is held today. I do have a photograph of part of that anyway. In this uh, aerial shot, you can see the rail yard uh, there that used to be there. And then in the bottom right-hand corner where those mounds of gravel and so forth are, that was Foster's as well. Later on at the location on 10th Street, there was a strip mall built uh, right along the 10th Street in front of uh, 10th Street. And it was built where that uh, yellow rectangle is. And we do have a picture of the strip mall. If you look at the north end uh, of the strip mall, you see that Foster's is represented by a tire shop. And they still had mounds of gravel there too along the riverside. And you can see as we scan over here to the right, uh, the Foster Tire Shop selling United States tires. Of course, back then, uh, not only did Water Street extend all the way into town, but you see that uh, gray strip at the bottom, see all the cars and the green grass beside it, and then right below that, the gray, that's Varney Street. 
And Barney Street used to extend all the way into 10th, so you could go right down Barney uh, to 10th Street. When Foster Lumber and Builder Supply was there, uh, on that little triangle right where uh, Varney and Water Street come together, there was a gas station, and on the triangle where Water Street and 10th comes together, there was also a gas station. The northernmost gas station was eventually torn down, but the southernmost, the one on the corner of Varney and Water Street, that was converted into a radio and TV shop. And you can see here that it says Raby Radio and TV. This was actually a repair shop where they fixed TVs and radios. Another thing I'd like to share with you that I thought was an interesting story. Before Foster Building Supply was there, there were just homes along 10th Street. Not very many, maybe three or four. One of these homes was owned by a Mr. Shaw. In 1898, John Hoffman bought the home from Mr. Shaw and he moved it across the street to the other side, and he converted the home into the Hoffman Saloon. Later on, that saloon would be torn down for the gas station that we looked at earlier. How do I know all this? Because of this article that was sent to me by Stacy Demick, one of my Fortune and History Facebook followers, pretty well lays out the whole story. All right, let's get back to Tenth and Lapeer, and uh, on the south side of the street, we can see Bell Tire here. Before Bell Tire, there was Delta Tire here. I don't have a photograph of Delta Tire, but uh, I do have an ad that I think you might get a kick out of, especially the prices. If you know anything about car repair prices today, these are really good prices. There's not much to look at between uh, 10th Street and 13th Street. But there were some photographs taken uh, years ago, uh, both uh, at 10th and at 13th and in between. And they were taken because of flooding. This photograph was taken in 1898 during the spring flooding. And it was taken on Lapeer Avenue. The water isn't real deep here, but certainly deep enough to make a mess. But the horse and buggy can still get through. Looking at the sidewalks on the other side, you can't really tell what they're like. But if we uh, scroll down here to uh, this side, you can see that the sidewalks are made out of wood and part of the sidewalk is submerged. There was worse flooding in 1909. This photograph here was taken on Lapeer looking south at 10th Street. And the uh, steeple in the background you see is the First Methodist Church. And you can see a streetcar coming up as well. There's another one taken the same year, and you can see it's steep enough for a couple of fellows to be canoeing down Lapeer Avenue. This was taken on Lapeer Avenue near 13th Street, looking west. And actually, this photograph was uh, contributed by my father, as you can see in the caption below. Not all flooding was caused by Mother Nature. Here we see a canoe going down uh, Varney Street with some people in it. And uh, it's not because of a spring thaw. It was because of a broken water main. And it appears that this photo was taken in 1972 and was posted by Jeff Barton. Well, I think we'll stop here for now and I uh, hope you'll join me in my next video and we'll continue uh, going down Lapeer Avenue and seeing what there is to see.